Today we have the pleasure and honor of visiting with uh, Sidney Mortensen. He uh, been in the Air Force for a number of years, retired as a lieutenant colonel, active duty, reserve. He lives in uh, Aberdeen, South Dakota, and he's been active in uh, ex-prisoner of war activities, uh, especially in North Dakota, because Aberdeen is fairly close, and we're, we've been privileged to have him as part of our organization. He, and, I've, uh, and I've been privileged to be a part of it. Oh, thank you. Being a North Dakota native. <laughs> Well, you have some connection with North Dakota, and we'll hear that in a few minutes. Okay. But I want to say that you uh, <coughs> you were in World War II. You flew uh, the B-17, and uh, you were uh, on your way to uh, Hamburg. I don't know if you got there or not, but you were shot down, taken prisoner of war. And uh, now we want to hear your story about uh, from the time you started school until you shot down, come back, and here you are today. So go right ahead, Sid. Well, I was, <clears throat> I was born and raised in Hamden, North Dakota, halfway between Devil's Lake and Langdon, and graduated from high school there in Hamden. Came down here to the university in 1934 and was here from 34 to 37. Well, if you <laughs> recall way that far back, that's when it was pretty pretty bare. Well, I was here in 36, see, so I... <laughs> you were here in 36? Yeah, 37. 30. So Dad said, Sid, he said, I'm afraid you're going to have to come home and help me. What did, I, what did I do? Gave me a team of horses and a mower, and I was mowing barley about six inches high. And I thought on 60 acres, I think we got about four, or well, maybe six or eight foot stacks. That was in 36, 37. Yep. Well, <coughs> then I went into the, uh, I, I'd written a, I'd written a civil service exam in Devil's Lake, I don't know, back in <coughs> 35, I think it was a year after uh, I came down here. <coughs> Forgot all about it. Got a telegram from Washington, D.C. Would you accept, if offered, a position as <coughs> Custodian, CU2, $10,080 uh, a year. <laughs> Please reply. I remember the plain as day signed by Onthank, who was Assistant Secretary of, the, uh, Secretary of War. Well, I, <clears throat> I replied to that and so I went into Washington, D.C. I had worked in Minneapolis off and on, just temporary work during uh, <coughs> 39, 38 and 39 because there wasn't anything to do at home on the farm. It was just just bare, nothing. Dad sold most of the cattle to keep those, you know. So <coughs> I replied and next thing I know I get a, another telegram that says report for duty in about three days. <laughs> Is that for the? For the department, uh, for the war department. War department. For the war department. And as I wound a civilian? Up, as a civilian. I wound up in the quartermaster general's office, which if I if would have been smart, I'd have stayed right there. <laughs> but in, on, in um, December of 1941, there were four of us. We, we were sitting around waiting for assignments. We'd sit around in a great big room. And they'd call our name, and you'd go someplace. Was that in the Pentagon? That was, no. They had no, no. built that, yes. Okay. That is a brand new Quartermaster General's building. It was built for the Social Security oh, Administration, and they never got in the building. Quartermaster took it over. So we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we were watching TV and reading the funny paper, and they said, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Well, three of us <laughs> had already had notices that we might get called sometime in the future, so what should we do? And all of us, I guess, thought the same thing at the same time. We better try to go home and come back, because we might not get home again. So one, I came to North Dakota, one fellow came to, he was a preacher's son from Edmore, North Dakota, but his, 
his dad had been transferred to a town in Iowa, and another boy in Chicago. Came home, went back, and the fellow from Edmore had already been called. They, we, they said that he had been transferred to Maxwell Field, Alabama. Well, <clears throat> from then on, it kind of unfolds. There, there's a lot of inter, intervening times, and, <clears throat> and I was, I didn't want to enlist. I didn't want to be called. I did, I wanted to enlist, but didn't know where. So I thought, well, Al was he's in he's in Maxwell Field. Maybe I could get there too. So I went out and enlisted in the Air Corps. Army Air Corps. That Army time. Air Corps. Yeah. yeah. Basic training or basic, basic training. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> of course, we all wanted to pipe. We wanted to be pilots. All sure. Of us. Everybody wants to be pilots. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we <clears throat> took our our uh, <clears throat> academic training in Maxwell Field, Alabama. Sent us down to to. Uh, oh. Uh, <clears throat> Was it Lakeland, Florida? Uh, no, not Lakeland. Uh, Sarasota. Oh, Sarasota. Yeah. Flying, uh, <coughs> flying Stearmans, by wing, uh, you know. B-17s. No, I no, mean PT-17. No. PT-17. Yeah. Yeah. Stearmans. Yeah, well, weird. I could do every exercise except one. And when I did that, and it was a, it was an easy one. Pick a pick a railroad or a telephone line. And stay right, keep the noise right on it, and, and, and do that. And every single time I did, I got sick. And this instructor said, you know, what's, what's the matter with you, Mortensen? He said, you, you can do those spins and stalls, and you get sick on that. She said, I'll give you one more chance. I, okay. Went up, same thing. I said, well, that's it. Back to Maxwell Field, Alabama. <coughs> we had two options. Navigation or bombardier? What do you want? Well, none of us knew which either, what, what either one of them was. Well, where, we, where would we go? Well, we don't know. We can't tell you that. Don't know. So a bunch of us held up our hands and said, go, we'll take bombardier. Okay, get on the train, ship you to Santa Ana, California. I don't remember where the navigators went. So we got out to Santa Ana. We were there. About, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> we were there, let's see. We got there in about uh, May or June of 42. And they sent us up to Victorville in the hottest part of the summer, about July or August, just, just fierce. Back to <clears throat> Santa Ana, California. Took the academic training there, meteorology. <laughs> Uh, uh, not ge algebra, geometry, trigonometry in about three weeks. <laughs> so we were sent, we were sent to Albuquerque, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there <coughs> we received some more academic training and some flying. We flew in the we flew. Uh, and probably you did too. In those little AT tens or yeah, like yeah, yeah, I think so. <coughs> you know, an engine. Real, yeah, right down on the right down on the gravel practically. Yeah. And then <coughs> we were ready for assignments. And uh, <coughs> another fellow and I who'd, who'd gone all through the survey. Well, we met in we met in Washington D.C. We went to Maxwell Field. We went to we went to Florida. We went to Santa Ana, California, and back to Albuquerque, and graduated. And we both got married the afternoon of the graduation. <laughs> so, the assignment was Boise, Idaho, to be assigned to the 379th Bomb Group. Okay, we were in Boise, I think, a uh, month and a half, <clears throat> and then to Wendover, Utah. You, what kind of planes did you fly there? That's where we, that's where we got our 17. 17. Yep. We on a crew then, or just yep. yeah? That the, the crew was assembled. Yeah. We were assigned a plane, and we we flew that plane all during the training. We flew it overseas, and we were shot down in it. 
So we knew that plane pretty well, except that yeah. it was a good, it was a good ship. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so <clears throat> went over Utah to Sioux City, Iowa. From there, with no warning at all, they, well, we here again we got a, we got about a, just about a week's leave. Visited our relatives, came back to Sioux City, Iowa, <clears throat> and the rest of the the rest of the bomb group had already left. So they said, you fellows, be out on the flight line at a certain time. We're going to fly to Salina, Kansas. We said, well, gee, we, we got our wives, we got our all our equipment, said, be there. We never saw the wives, we never said goodbye. Anybody, all our stuff was in the hotel. <laughs> Down we went, Salina, Kansas. We were there, I think, three days, and overseas we went. Landed in um, Goose Bay. A couple of days there for, uh, I don't remember for what. <clears throat> and right straight across the Great Circle Route, over to Presswick, Ireland. Landed there. Beautiful, beautiful April Sunday, I think it was. Just beautiful. You talk about Ireland being the emerald island. It, it really was nice. So they sent us down to a f airfield called Bobbington Green, right on the very north end of London. Just we couldn't hardly really take off to get to get out of the out of the London traffic. But we were there not too long, but uh, I think it was three weeks. <clears throat> we, we were sleeping on the floor. We were dig we were opening cans and and making fires outside. That they weren't ready for us at all. But uh, we survived, <laughs> flew missions during the day, and came back to the barracks in the afternoon or at night and opened a bunch of cans and ate some more and went to bed. Then we were assigned to the <coughs> permanent base, which was Kimbolton, Kimbolton Air Force Base. It was, it was uh, north of London, about uh, 60 miles, north and a little east. Between London and the Wash, that yeah. that area in the <coughs> up in north, started flying missions right away. I think the first one was Saint Nazaire, and the second one was Saint Nazaire, France, Wilhelmshaven, Germany, Hulst, Germany, and then Hamburg. Number four. Number four. <laughs> it was an all-out effort. Now, after we were shot down and were in prison camp, they said that <coughs> that 178 B-17s took off, and not one plane got to Hamburg that that day. Well, you, you know, Elmer, the the pilot's instructions. He was if you, well, we went through soup, uh, yeah, sure. if overcast, three of them, sure. about eight, ten thousand feet thick, every one. And you know, the pilot's supposed to go straight, the right wing man is supposed to go 15 degrees, and the left wing 15 degrees. They were, they were hitting each other on the way up. 26,000 feet, we broke out, in the, broke out in the clear. And there was B-17s all over the sky. Yes. They had contrails by them, too? <laughs> no, no, oh, no. Clear up there. But no formation. No nothing, formation. Just nothing. Everybody just tacked onto somebody's wing and... <laughs> And we were we were we were uh, uh, <coughs> we were following orders, radio silence. Yeah, sure. So we didn't get the the, the the call back, and all of a sudden these planes were going by and made a 180 degree turn, and you know we we didn't know what was happening. Well, if we had been, <coughs> you know, looking back, it's easy to figure. If we'd have got in the into the formation instead of sitting out there until. The fighters were sitting just out of range, on each edge of the edge of the wings, just just waiting for somebody. To, but with these, we didn't see these up above, and they were starting to go through the formation. And the incendiaries got us right in the bomb bays, set us on fire. The fighter came from the top and went through you. Yeah. yeah. So we'd, we'd made an agreement among the crew <coughs> that if that ever happened, or we, you know, especially if we were set on fire or somebody was hit, we'd head for the deck. 
yeah. and try to get back to, to England. So the pilots did an excellent job. They drove through these overcasts, you know, and down through, and <laughs> everybody was, was pitching stuff out of the airplane, you know, guns and equipment and stuff to lighten the load. But <coughs> the, uh, the, 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 the fire kept, kept burning, and the first, the first hit we had knocked out our inter intercom. So we didn't know what was going on in the front end of the ship or the back end of the ship, except the pilot kept saying there's, there's smoke going out of the Here, maybe you could uh, explain on here's an airplane. You could tell a little bit about, about where the fire was now and and. Uh, okay, yeah, this this is the, this is the this is the ball turret, and the bomb bays were right, right in here. They right opened up. Yeah, they, they dropped, the wings went down this, or the doors went this way and this way. So I don't know, incendiaries, I suppose. I don't know. Well, we, we dro oh, by the way, we dropped, I, I salvoed the bombs as we were going down. Get, yeah. rid, of the, get rid of the load. Yeah. So I, I don't know where I dropped those, but I just pushed yeah. the lever and, but it just, it was just all, well, <coughs> the, uh, the top turret man, there were doors right here and he opened those doors to, to, to show, to, you know, to remind the pilot and it was, just like you'd look into a blast furnace, just fire. You couldn't see the couldn't see the radio man or any of the equipment back here. So of course, when that happens, you know what the order is. Sure. You don't listen to anything. You, you just you just go. Have a chest pack or a, or a pack on the back. No, I had no. I had, a, had, I, had, I had a seat pack. Oh, you had a seat pack. I had a seat pack. I and the navigator both had seat packs. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> I, I went back and the pilot said, just we motion, you know, get out. So I went down and kicked out the, the front hatch, the door. You just kick out, a, you just pull a lever on the door and kick it and it, and it falls out, right? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I kicked that door out and the navigator started pushing me, you know, he wanted me to go first. I didn't want to go at all. <laughs> So, uh, what altitude were you at then? Yeah, I don't even know. Oh. That until that altimeter was going around you sure. like a spinning wheel. Sure. You know? I'm I'm just guessing that we were probably between five and eight thousand feet because you couldn't see the ground no. even at, even up there. I couldn't see the ground. So Belmire, the navigators, <laughs> you know, go said go. So I, you know, you're supposed to take your head, your hands over your head. And just ease out, and that's what I did. He right behind me, and the top turret man up here. He was. <coughs> there were three of us hanging in the parachutes when we broke out of the you into the see crate. the others. Yeah. Yeah. So here comes two FW 190s, and and I and the navigator, and they just, they just flew a figure eight around the two of us all the way to the ground. They did. Did they? They fire at you? Never did, and they could have. They could have shot us, you know. They could have shot us out of the chute. They sure. shot us or shot the chute out. Anything. Yeah. But they were good Germans, I guess. <coughs> well, I landed just not too far from where the airplane crashed, and the fire was was flying up. <coughs> And it was, I, I, in fact, I lived behind a barn in a civilian prison camp. <laughs> and these fellows standing around the barn, you know, they, they were looking up at me coming down, of course. And I could see a soldier riding down the road. There was a, just a, a, a dirt road. You're riding a bicycle. But he kept looking up at me, you know. And I said <laughs> so I landed in this, bar behind the barn. <coughs> Hurt yourself when you landed? No, no. I was bleeding a little bit from I, I, I was bleeding from the back of my hands here, but it doesn't hurt. No. I, you know, so I was uh, pulling grass, covering, tried to cover up my chutes. Pretty soon I hear this fellow, Rouse, Rouse. <laughs> well, I him, you know. So I got up and he had his he had his rifle. So I put up my hands. And he says, uh, bomb bomb. 
bomb bomb. And I didn't know what that was either. But he keep, kept, kept pointing, you know, back here. Then I realized it was that, that 45 pistol oh. that he wanted. And I, you know, I opened up my <coughs> flak suit, my, my flying suit. Did you get, did you get those the officer's greens with the electric suits? Did you have those? Uh, y yes. Did you? I, I, I didn't have, I can't remember being shot down in that, you know, in oh. a green suit. The first time we'd ever wore them was on that tour, on that trip, because yeah. it was supposed to be a long, yeah. you know, a long trip yeah. to Hamburg. But there were felt shoes brought up to here. I had the felt shoes, yeah. Plugged in. And I lost a shoe on, when I jumped out. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Until you get a pretty hard snap from that parachute open. <laughs> yes, sir. And they all, all the fellows had the same thing, you know. Wasn't it? Was it so? Wasn't it so quiet? Yeah, I know it. Hang, really still. Hanging in the chutes. Yeah. Then you wave at them. You know. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, this this uh, soldier, and I had seen the the top turret man. Uh, I'd seen him land in in a in a field over a fence, not oh, I suppose about a half a block from where I went down in, in the pasture. <clears throat> and after the soldier came over and he frisked me and uh, and I kept pointing over in, the, in that wheat field to this fellow that I knew I knew he was hurt but I could I, I well I I thought I saw it that I thought that I could see that he was hurt but anyway <clears throat> the soldier with me had him climb through this three wire fence walked into the wheat field and here was the top third man laying in the bleeding he had three uh, <clears throat> 20 millimeters in, in his right leg and bleeding, bleeding pretty bad. Was he unconscious or no? Conscious? No, he was conscious. So <clears throat> I said to this German soldier, I said, you know, uh, made motions, pick him up and get him back to this farmhouse, which was, I suppose, up by the barn anyway. Yeah. And you know that that German soldier put his rifle over his shoulder, put the Brinkman, that was the top turret man's name, between us, my arm around one side and the German soldier's arm around the other, and we carried him back into that farmhouse and laid him down on the floor. Well. Did he live? Yeah, he, he, he lived. He's, as far as I know, he's still alive today, but I haven't heard of him for many months. So these, there were, there were a couple of teenage girls and a lady in this farmhouse. And of course, when we carried him in, there was a trail of blood from the door under where we laid him down on the, on the uh, linoleum floor and a little pool of blood. And, <clears throat> you know, and I, I said, get some, get some bandages. Well, this one girl, this one teenage girl kind of understood what I was saying. And pretty soon she brought a basin full of hot water and some bandages. So I, <coughs> I, I just, I don't know whether I, whether I still had a knife, but I remember cutting that flight suit, just, just cutting it right up to, to get to get at the wounds. Yeah. Well, then I realized that I had to shut off the blood to, to, to get a tourniquet. Yeah. So I took off my belt, put it around his leg, way up by his thigh, and tightened that up to try to stop the flow of blood. And this teenage girl and I were washing his leg and <clears throat> and he kept saying, Sid, give me a cigarette. I said, no, <clears throat> Brink, I said, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a shot. You know, well, sh what are you gonna what are you give me a shot of? Well he, I said, you know we got those little kits? Well, you probably got them too. Yeah. Those escape kits? Yeah. Square square plastic box. Yeah. So I opened this box, and of course, this French money fell out of the floor. <laughs> this soldier, this soldier boy, he was he was right there. He, gra he grabbed that French money right away. But I got that, <clears throat> I got that, that morphine. You know those yeah, I, needles. Yeah. And I'd never given a shot to anybody before. <laughs> but I said, Brink, hang on. I said, I don't know whether it's going to hurt or not. And if you remember in training. They said if you have to give anybody a morphine shot, you're supposed to put an X on their forehead. 
I don't remember that. That morphine okay. was brown. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So I gave him, you know, I put an X on his forehead. Said, give me a cigarette. Well, I didn't, I didn't dare, I didn't dare reach for the cigarettes even because I knew I had a pack almost full that I knew what I had heard, you know, the value of the cigarettes. Sure. So <clears throat> I said, um, said, well, just, just hang on, just hang on a little bit. <clears throat> well, then he, then he, the pain then really started setting in. And he started, he started to kind of whine and scream and, and I said, Brink, <clears throat> I think I'm going to give you another shot. Anything, but give, but just give me a cigarette. <laughs> just give me, <laughs> give me a, let me have a smoke. So I gave him another shot. That is, there's only those two hypo needles in the in that yeah. pack. So I put another X on his forehead, <clears throat> and that that relaxed him. And we tied bandages around each one of the three wounds. And this one, this one up here was kind of in the flesh and really, and blood was really coming out. <clears throat> but this this girl was real helpful. But God bless her, and she was kind of making the bandage, and I was putting them on and tying them up and trying to stop the blood. In the meantime, a fellow came in with a with a white collar uh, minister. At least that's what he said. He was a minister. Of course, the first words were in English. For you, the war is over. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. I heard that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so he said, "No, you, we'll take care of you. Just, just everything, just fine. Just we'll take care of you." Well, I probably failed to mention back. I did. I did fa fail to mention that. <clears throat> Between the time that I was, I lit in the pasture, and we got Brinkman up to the <coughs> house, I could see the, I could see the fire. Of the plane, crashed yeah, plane. Yeah, way up in the sky, two, three hundred feet, yeah. you know, just standing up. And <coughs> as soon as that, while I was trying to help him out, I was thinking about escape. You know, you're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. Every minute, right after you shot down, is, is supposed to be valuable. So. I got. I, I said, uh, Brink. I said, I got to go out. And I got to go outside and look around. <clears throat> well, I said, Don't leave me. Don't leave me here. I said, Don't leave me here. No. I said, I'll, I'll be here. Well, there was a tractor <clears throat> and a homemade four-wheel rubber-tired trailer on behind flatbed coming down the road toward this farmhouse. And on the flatbed trailer was pieces out of the airplane. You know the radio. Oh, I see. Yeah. Stuff, and there was a piece of a, of a wing, and there was a there was a piece of the tail that they'd picked up and put on top of this flatbed, and it looked like they were heading for the for the airplane. So, you know, they saw me standing inside the fence, and there was a fence around the house, and um, started talking. Of course, I couldn't understand them, and they couldn't understand me. But I kept pointing down to the fire. And I reached in, and pulled out a pack of cigarettes, <laughs> and so I, I said, you know, point down there, cigarette for you, and if you take me down there, boy, they understood that right away. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> I gave the fellow on the tractor a cigarette, and by that time the other fellow was back on the top of the flatbed trailer, and he reached down and grabbed my hand. Pulled up on the trailer and away we went <laughs> down to the airplane. There was every kind of German uniform. I never saw I never saw more uni different color different kinds of uniforms than I saw that day around that airplane. Sand looking at it burning. Yeah. And <clears throat> there was a fellow with a kind of a tan uniform came up and he could speak broken English. And he would start asking me questions, you know, where'd you come from and where were you going? And I just said, name, rank, and serial number. Yeah. Pretty soon a civilian came along, very good looking man, I, I imagine in his 50s. <clears throat> and he could speak very good English. And he said, now I understand you. I said, I understand you got a wounded man up there in the, on the farm. And I said, yes. He said, well, we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna take you into into town, and we'll take care of him. 
the, uh, he said, there's a, there's a couple of bodies laying over here. I said, could I, could, do, you know, do you know how many there are? Well, he said, there's one right there under the wing. And so I went over there under the left wing. There was the pilot's body. He's dead? Yeah. He said, there's another fellow laying over there by the trees. So I walked over there. That this was, here was the top turret man. Not, not, not the fellow that, that parachuted with me, but no. <clears throat> the senior top turret man, I guess. Engineer, the engineer, engineer, that, yeah. engineer. So that is two bodies. They're both dead. Both dead. And they I got out too late then, I suppose, or what? I don't know. I, I yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so, including the including the pilot. Yeah. You know, because he'd been he was out of the airplane, and how he got under the wing, of course, I don't know. Maybe he was oh. crawling. Yeah. So then they said, well, there's another fellow back here, <coughs> behind the plane. Yeah, I mean behind behind the fuselage. The fuselage was oh maybe uh, 50 yards ahead of where the tail section was, and the tail section wasn't damaged or too bad. No. So I went back there, and here laid the the the, the ball turret man. Now the ball turret yeah. is right there. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know how he ever got out of it. Because you know that's they're electrically operated. Yeah. And how he got that ball turned around and got up and out of there, I had to have I, I, to this day. But there was a sad story with that. When we left Salina, Kansas, he and a couple of fo other fellows started uh, <coughs> just horsing around in the, in the shower. And he he had fallen up against a, a wooden bench in the shower. And, and kind of hurt himself. Well, they were going to take him over to the to the, to the hospital and have him checked, but he, he didn't want to go. But in the middle of the night, why, <clears throat> I guess it got pretty bad, so he, he agreed to go over to the hospital. We took off the next day about 10 o'clock in the morning, got a replacement, just, you know, they just yeah. stuck a body in there, yeah. and we left him there. The night before we took off on that trip to, to Hamburg, he, he had hitchhiked from Salina, Kansas, got out of the hospital, hitchhiked, clear across the ocean, found, it, found out where we were, and, and got up to our Kim Bolton base the night before we took off. So this is about 11 o'clock at night, and, and here, comes, here comes Miller, and he said, uh, you know, we were with the, the four of us, the pilot, the navigator, and, and the, and the, uh, <coughs> and the uh, co pilot. Co -pilot. Co -co yeah. yeah, the four of us were in the Hansen. Yeah. He you were the officers on the plane, yeah. Yeah, the four yeah, of us. Yeah, there's NCOs. Right. And he came in and he said to the pilot, he said, okay, can, are you going on a mission tomorrow? Yep. Can I go along? Kind of, you know, <coughs> groom said, uh, Doug Groom was the pilot's name. He said, you, you got to get clearance from the adjutant. So, you know, we were, he says, what concert is he in? Well, the pilot went with him. They went over and talked to the adjutant. The adjutant said, no way. I can't, I can't give you permission. <coughs> well, he didn't get permission, but he came along anyway. He was there when we were going to take off. And, and the pilot said, OK. Because he was a he was a good man, good armor, yeah. in that ball turret, and he knew that every wheel and yeah. adjustment. And there, five hours later, I saw him laying on the ground, burned. He, he had you know the the, the the ball turret men had these helmets. Yeah, his face was was just burned to a crisp, and all the clothing burned off. Clear down to his knees, just stripped. Was he dead? Yep. So they said, "Well, there's one more man, but he, he probably, probably don't even. We don't know whether he was even on your crew." And I said, "Where is he?" Well, between the fuselage and the tail, in the trees, was lay just a just a coal black body, burned to a crisp. 
Well, <clears throat> hair was burnt off. All his whole body, all his clothes were burnt off. And as I say, his skin was just, just black. <clears throat> so I, I really didn't know. But I, I thought that's got to be the, the radio man. And we discussed it later on with the with the with the navigator and the and the and the top turret man, and they said, "Yeah, it had to be him." It's so, okay. That took that took care of <coughs> of the pilots, the engineer, the top turret man, and the radio man, and the ball turret man. So where is the tail gunner and the and the co-pilot and the and the navigator? Took care of all but four of us. <coughs> the uh, how are we doing? <laughs> are we, are we doing okay. Do you want a little break, maybe for a few minutes? That'd be good. That'd okay, be yeah, a little, a little closer off for about five minutes here. Okay, you get catch your breath there. Very good. Yeah. Very good. I was talking about the <coughs> the fellow that that I went that was that had the charred body, and, and we could we could account for we could account for five men if, if my addition is right, but uh, <coughs> the tail gunner and the and the and the uh, co-pilot and the navigator. <coughs> One more anyway. So we figured, well, oh no, the navigator, the navigator, he hadn't, he hadn't show, he was missing too. But that night, <clears throat> well, this fellow that could speak perfect English said, "We're going to put you in that van right there and take you into town." And he said, "Don't worry about, don't worry about uh, this fellow that you left on the farm. We'll pick him up too." Now this, are you near Hamburg now? No, no. Oh, no. oh yeah. This is right by the crash site. We're still, oh, yeah, yeah. We're still by the crash site. <clears throat> so they put the put the fellow that I'd got out of the wheat field and myself put him on a stretcher in the back of a van and I sat in there with a with this guard and off we went. <clears throat> I don't know. We were in the, we were in the you know, on the road I suppose for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. And we pulled into a <clears throat> into another farm. And the barn had about six foot uh, stone foundation around it. And then a and then a hip roof. And this was a this was a, a barn where you know where you they, they drove the hay right into the up on the second floor into right into the hay mound unloaded. But we were down they stuck us down below and, in this <coughs> in in this foundation, well, one by one, until there were about, I think nine of us from our same squadron came in, you know, one at a time. Where they'd come through the gate or come through the barn door, <coughs> and uh, later on that evening, in comes the navigator. So then we, we could account for five of us being alive from the crash site. <coughs> well, in came a couple of old fellows, old I mean old soldiers, with the green kind of the, you know uh, they looked like, looked like celluloid caps with the with the peaks you know the peaks oh. sticking out. Yeah, they old do. German. Yeah. You know, way back World War One sure. style. And they came in. They said, well. You guys got to take off all your clothes. Well, why do we have to do that? Because we got to we got to <coughs> search you, and we're going to take your clothes. So you can't run away. <laughs> there's one, there's one old fellow. He, he, he kind of, 
he didn't speak very good English, but he, he got the word across. So, okay, out comes the, the guns, you know, get, get going. Stripped us absolutely naked, shoes and socks. So then another fellow, this other, this other old fellow come along and he had an arm full of clothes. And he'd, he'd toss out a shirt, you know, and, a, and I got a pair of Polish britches, OD britches, and a pair of socks, and a pair of Dutch wooden shoes, and a, and a blue uh, RAF jacket. That is my clothes. And the same with the other, the other guys got similar, but, but shoes, they took our shoes and gave us these wooden shoes. You know, see, yeah. clomped around there, <laughs> and and a lot of us, a lot of us, uh, got blisters from, you know, well I suppose it was rubbing or something, you know. Anyway, so <clears throat> we found out that uh, I'm trying to think now. Oh, then they put us, they put us back in another van with uh, pieces of the plane. And just about well, as I say, I think there were eight or nine of us from our from our <coughs> 379th bomb group, and most a lot of them from our squadron. And we drove till oh gosh for three four hours, and stopped <coughs> at a railroad station. And some one of the guys peeked out and saw the name Quakenbrook on the on the station. Well. Nobody knew where Quakenbrook was, no. but at least we, we, we had a name. Anyway. Yeah, we had a name where, where we'd been. And from then on, you know, I, it's a little, my, my memory is pretty dim, but because we were tired out, you know, we, we left, uh, yeah. took off, I, I suppose, about 5 o'clock in the morning. Had you had anything to eat or Nothing to drink? Eat, you had no, you had no eat or drinks. And the strain, you know, and the tenses. And I, I just, I'm just guessing that about 11, 12 o'clock at night, <coughs> they got it. They put us on board this train, and we rode that train that night, and as I recall, most of the next day. And again, somebody looked out and saw a sign that said Frankfurt. And this was on the Mainz, on the one on the Mainz. There's two Frankfurts, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Right? This was Frankfurt on the Mainz, on the Mainz River. Yeah. Frankfurt on the older. That's that's one. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's the other one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Out of the out of the train. Onto the road. That's the last time that I saw the fellow that I got out of the wheat field. The last time I saw him, he was laying in a stretcher, among, oh God probably eight or nine or ten other guys that stretcher just lined up alongside of that depot wall and we guys that could walk down the road and we walked all the way out to do log lift one there's a name for that little town I, I, I can't remember can't remember either. I can't name so <clears throat> got there again uh, <clears throat> that's the interrogation center now that yep, you're right that's, that's yeah. right that's right that's stuck to long and NCOs Air Force. Right. Might have been Army, too. I'm not sure, but at least I know the Air no, Force. No, no. I didn't see any Army men. No, I didn't. And Luftwaffe officers. Yeah, that's Blue, right. all Luftwaffe officers. Officers and men, I should say. Yeah. They were both. And so into a little cubicle. Everybody into a signal cubicle. And this was about, uh, <clears throat> I guess, four feet wide and about, about ten feet long. Eight to ten foot. Long. One window is all glazed window. Yeah. You couldn't see out. <coughs> and I got I got to tell you this one. We were we were in. I think I was I think I was in there either six or seven days. Yeah. You know, and they took call you in. You know. Yeah. And I suppose they did the same for yeah, you. Did they, right. Elmer? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well. During this three or four days, or the first three or four days, they weren't getting, they haven't, they weren't, they apparently, and I, I have to just surmise this, that they weren't apparently having very good luck. So there was, there was pipes, those heat pipes yeah. going through the, <laughs> you know, with the flanges on them, the yeah. baffles, and, and they, they turned the heat on, 
and it just it, it was just almost unbearable. And I guess most of us did the same thing. The, the floor was fairly cool, so we lay down on the floor to try to get away from the heat. After we were let out of there, after this was, we, we were, they got their information, and we got out of there. <clears throat> One of the fellows came into that open area, and his face, and his nose, and his lips, and his chin was just filled full of stickers, wood slivers, wood slivers. You know, and this guy says, the hell did you do? He said, "Well, they, they, they didn't." He said, "They didn't do it to me." He said, "I, I got, so, I got so hot, I got so overheated. I laid down on the floor." And he said, "I started chewing the corner of the of the of the door." And he apparently, you know, like a like a dog, and he chewed off a corner of the door. We saw it afterwards. Chewed off about a half the corner of a door, so you could get some some fresh air out of the out of the corridor. But he was, oh man, he was really a mess. Well, about the, I don't know how it worked out with you, but about the fifth day, I think it was, and this interrogation officer was a, was a second lieutenant, uh, first lieutenant, I think, spoke perfect English, absolutely perfect English. Better, than, his grammar was better than mine. <coughs> And about, as I say, about the fourth or fifth day, I, went and I came in and he had a big smile on his face, you know, and he handed me a cigarette, offered me a cigarette. Yeah, sure. And I said, well, I said, you've done that before. I said, uh, thanks anyway, no thanks. Well, he said, you know, Mortensen, he said, uh, if you had told me, answered my questions, you could have been out of that room and out getting some good food out, of, out in the, whatever they call it. That open area, anyway. Yeah. So he had a <clears throat> he had a legal size bunch of papers laying on his desk, right in, right in front of him. And he reached down, he pulled off the, some of the papers off, and he turned that legal size pad around, and he said, "Take a look at this." There were our orders, marked stamped secrets, that we got when we left Salina, Kansas. I see. All names from every every crew, every crew, and <coughs> all 36 crews in our in our group. He said, "Now, if you'd have told me that that you that you were in the 527 squadron and the groom was your commander, he said, you could have got out of here." Well, I, I was so dumbfounded, absolutely, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't say a word, except I said, "Well, you you know more than I can tell you, so no use." You and I talk. Well, he said, I got, I got a couple of couple of questions. <laughs> it's same thing. Where were you going? Where were you going? Where were you, where'd you fly from? He said, I think you were flying from Kim Bolton, right? And he had a, he had a, he had a form there that he was marking, yes and no. If I said no, invariably I was telling a lie. He'd mark yes. If I said yes and I was telling a lie, he'd mark no. So he he was right, brilliant. I, I you know a brilliant officer yeah. in my opinion. Looked off a perfect grooming. He was yeah. spit and polish. Yeah. <coughs> As I say, spoke excellent English. Well, okay. So I got out of there and out into this open area where they served you. you know, they they served us food. Served us food. No, no, they didn't serve us food. They, they prepared the food in the great big kettles. And you'd go up and take a, you know, a scoop full of soup and go back to the wooden table and sit down and eat. And I, to this day, I can't remember how how long we were there. All I remember is that <clears throat> one day they said, "You're going to go to a permanent pa camp, real nice, not like this. Have good food and nice barracks and, <laughs> and good beds." <coughs> okay. Again, onto the train, and away we went. And I mean, we were on that train for for two or three days and nights with no food. So <coughs> we wound up at this camp, 
you know, everybody out into the, into the, into it. They put us in what, what we called, and what was still called, the center camp. And there were Poles, and there were Norwegians, and there were Swedes, and there were English RAF men. <clears throat> there were Americans, there were Australians, there were Indians, everything. This was, this was kind of the reception center, this one camp. Was that a Sagan? Yeah, it was a Sagan. <clears throat> How far, where's Sagan from uh, Berlin? It's I mean, just generally south or east? Or south, west? no, uh, yeah, south, right. About 90, they said it was about 92 miles south and east of Berlin. Yeah. Okay. About, we were only about uh, four or five miles from the Polish border. Oh, yeah. In the Oder River. Yeah, Oder, right, okay. Right, in that. So, <clears throat> uh, we were in this, you know, and it, you know, we, of course, it's picture looking for this good food and all this, all these nice beds and everything. <laughs> well, I think I think at that time there were just two, two double bunks. Later on, there were three, you know. <laughs> and the <clears throat> the uh, mattress was a gunny sack, you know, yeah, filled up with excelsior or straw, depending on how lucky. And the blankets was one gray. Pretty good woolen blanket. That was it. And the food, uh, as I say, we went to a, these big vats, and yeah. you had a you had a, a big, great, big dish, or was it a, a, a bowl? Uh, Each man had a bowl. Usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking about the dipper that we oh, used yeah. to dip oh, in and yeah. fill your bowl and go and sit down. Yeah. And you know, it was it was it was food because we, we hadn't had very much. <laughs> Now the <clears throat> now my, my now my memory gets now my memory gets pretty dim because we were separated from this center camp. You know the Australians and the RAF and the Indians. The, the, these Indians. Did you ever see any of those? With Didn't have any where I was at. No. Turbans. No. Nope. Big turbans. Yeah. And they were. I tell you, those guys were. They were. They were rough. Man, but, they didn't. They didn't take any guff from. Germans, if they stuck a, if they stuck a barrel right in their mouth, they didn't care. You know, just boy, they were. They <laughs> so they separated us, <clears throat> and of course they were building this brand new camp just to the west of the center camp, which became known as the South Camp. And as I say, whether it was a month or three months or whatever, I don't remember. And one day they said, "Okay, we're going to move you into this brand new camp." Well, this is this is really nice. You That's know. American now. Yeah, this yep. is American. So they put us in the South Camp, only Americans, <clears throat> and they were as brand new. They, they, of course, it was all wood, and they had the same bunks and they had the same mattresses, and <clears throat> but uh, it was new. And. <clears throat> And uh, we just we just kind of teamed up. If you had some friends, you know, they'd yeah. say, "Well, how about why don't we? When do we see?" At that time, we were getting. At that time, when we moved us to that South Camp, we were getting one. One Red Cross box. Per man per week, right? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Is that was that right? Well, I, and that's at the most. Yeah, they used yeah. to be about every two weeks or three weeks there. Well, well, towards the end, of course, it was. Oh yeah, no, yeah. no, it, it always got less all the time. Yeah, you know, less, less food and more men to. to That's right. But I think I think it was anyway. <clears throat> so we just four, uh, six of us just said, okay, we'll pool our Red Cross bars. Yeah, we'll call it a combine or something. Right. Yeah. Yep, combine. And this one fellow, we, well, I don't know. He claimed he was a pretty good cook, and he, he turned out to be a real good cook. He, he could he could make something out of nothing. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we formed this group, and uh, that went on for several months. And by the time then, then of course there were men coming in all the time, sure. so we had to make room for one more or two more, and so on <clears throat> until I think we had. I think we had um, three, six, nine, twelve. I think we had twelve men. Three, four, four bunks of four. Yeah, four bunks of three high. I think it was tw twelve. 
and uh, took turns. Two guys would cook for a week, you know, put the food together and take it out on a stove. A little stove, but we had a little stove about that wide, about so wide. So what, kind of a porcelain thing? Or? No, no, there's irons. Oh, iron. Iron. I didn't see any of those. Just like your mother and dad used to have out, yep. on, out on the farm. Yep. No, they didn't have <laughs> two lids, two, yep. two iron lids. <coughs> that, with those, we, we shared that stove with 126 men. <laughs> that one stove. <laughs> so they put, a, they put a roster on the wall, you know. Well, they, they had designated rooms. Like this was one, two, three. It wasn't a room, but it was a combine, you know. Just yeah. And before we put the... We put the, the bunks around the wall, so it kind of looked like a room. <clears throat> well, uh, let's see. <clears throat> One bad experience we had there during that time was was they came in with uh, camembert cheese. Did you ever get into that? No. Nope. Little round. No, nope, never. You can see them in the stores yeah, even yeah. now. Little yeah. round, they're about that thick, yeah. you know. And it's, it smells worse than Limburger. Yeah. But this uh, fellow that was a cook, <clears throat> and we, we told him, he said, God, now don't, 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 spoil, don't spoil the food with any of that cheese. No, no. He'll. So we, 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 we had, we had uh, peeled potatoes and cooked them in between, you know, as I say, you, you had to get on the stove whenever you could. And they had one, the one black pot, I suppose, about that big around but so deep. That is the only cooking device we had, except what we made, you know. For how many men was that? Twelve. Twelve, okay. And you put, the, I suppose you made, opened the cans yeah. and tucked them together and made a yeah. pan out of them. Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> we had cooked some potatoes, and he put the potatoes in, in, in this, in this uh, pan that we had made out of tin cans. <clears throat> And he took some, mixed up some clim, you know. Yeah. Clim was, was uh, dehydrated milk, right? Is that right? Yeah, in a milk, skim yeah. milk. <clears throat> it was powdery form. He stirred that up with some water. And so that, that was kind of a, kind of made it kind of milky. And then he, then he put this cheese all over the top of the whole works. Stuck it in the stove. When he came in, when he came down with that, I tell you, it smelled like the worst, the worst toilet that you ever, you know, that you ever run into. And you said, "My God, Shorty, you you ruined the food." Well, we were, <clears throat> of course, there were there two or three other folk of the fellows were German, so and they knew about this camembert cheese, including this cook. He was Schreffer was his name. He was from Pennsylvania. And they said, oh, that's good, that's good. It smells bad, but just hold your nose. And <laughs> I, I, I tried, and I, rather than lose what I did have in my stomach, <laughs> you know, I, I said, boys, uh, who, 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 who likes some of this? I, I, just, I just can't, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna heave. <clears throat> on the other hand, on the, on the other hand, we had, we had some good experiences too. The, we um, during the winter of um, during the winter of '43. Let's see. Yeah, during the winter of '43. How many years were you in the camp, or how many months were you in that camp? <coughs> well, I don't. I really, I really, I really don't know. But total yeah. total time was 674 days, just 22 months. 22. Yeah, sure. And as I say, I, the time at each one, I, I, yeah, I just, don't know. you know. But I'm going to tell you that <clears throat> during the winter of '43, you know, I said to the fellows, because <clears throat> we were getting oh, I don't know how they served you fellows your potatoes to to begin with, those 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 uh, those lead pots. Did you have lead pots that said "kind drink water" on the outside? No. Nope. Which means not drinking water. No. Nope. That's the only thing we had to carry water. Carry water. <laughs> And they'd bring the, they'd cook the potatoes with the jackets on up in the cookhouse in these great big vats. They were army field uh, kitchen. kitchen. Yeah. And then they'd bring, they'd put it, put the, put the boiled potatoes in these lead pitchers. These lead pitchers were about that high, about so big around, and they'd fill them up. 
depending upon how many guys were cooking sure. together. Sure. And they'd bring them in and they'd just empty that lead pitcher out in the right, right in the right in the hallway in the corridor. You know, there was yeah. two sides. There was a corridor down the middle. Yeah. Dump it right there. And, okay, that's for you guys, number one or number two or whatever. And we had to scrape it off the floor. You know, we <clears throat> a lot of the guys. Could, so I guess the commander or somebody, some of the officers said, well, uh, we'll, we'll try to appeal to the Germans. Give, let, give, us, the, give us the potatoes. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we'll cook them or whatever. And by golly, they did. They said, okay, that'll save them some work. Yeah. So we got a ration, what is it, 300 grams per day per man or something, which was, you know, yeah. a couple of, th couple of little potatoes like that. But I said to the guys, you know, it, it, it could get worse. Yeah. Why don't we try to save some of these little ones and we'll plant them in the spring? God forbid that we're still here. <laughs> oh, Sid, what, you know, you're off. You're, you're losing your art. You're, you're losing your marbles already. <laughs> what do you mean? Take God, we're, we're, we're hungry enough now. We're not going to... Well, I said, there's that, there's that cardboard box. Why don't we just throw it in there about every two, three days? Oh, no. Well, I finally hummed <laughs> until they finally agreed, well, maybe. So I, <clears throat> I visibly, you know, visibly, it had to be visible. They could see them so they knew somebody wasn't taking them out of there. <laughs> and I'd tell them when I'd put one in there or two <clears throat> until spring came. And I bought the, let's see. <clears throat> Dad always used to say that he had to put the potatoes in on Good Friday. I see. Yeah. Remember that? Well, no, that, I, that is an yeah. old theory. That sure. Single, single, yeah. single player. By the way, I come from Fairdale, see, so I'm not. Oh, very, really? Yeah. Sure. Is that right? So I, I'm no. not very far. No, <laughs> you're not. No, you're not far <laughs> Just away. Just over the hill there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is Dad's theory that. Yeah. Sure. Put that single bottom plow, yeah. two horses, plant those potatoes on Good Friday. Yeah. Didn't make a difference if there was still ice there in the furrow. <laughs> Put them in, and that's what I told the guys. I said, I don't know, but I said <clears throat> that was that was my dad. Well, so this fellow from Wisconsin, he and I were, we kind of <clears throat> became the. We did the cooking together, and we did the sweeping together, and you know we did the, the yeah. when it was our turn. Yeah. So I said to <clears throat> to Nactway, I said, uh, one day we. We better we better get these potatoes ready. And he knew that he knew too, but he wasn't about to say anything that we were going to cut them up and get them ready to sure. to, to plant. So we spent one whole day and you know we took these potatoes and we were taking the eyes and sliced them in half. Maybe we'd get three pieces out of one. And these guys came in and they they said, "What in the hell are you guys doing? Here we've been saving these potatoes all winter." And here you're cutting them up. <laughs> well, <coughs> Easter Sunday came along. I think the day I think it was the day after Easter Sunday. And I said, "Okay, we got to we got to get some try to get some tools from the Germans." And right outside the windows in the barracks, you know, you whoever whoever your larger group was, that was your space sure. you know, between the door yeah. between the windows. Yeah. So. We asked the Germans if they'd give us a, a spade and a hoe. I think it was I think I think we, I think we got a spade and a hoe, and we just made furrows and put the, put the potatoes in there. And then we asked them for some seeds. Well, that word got around camp real fast that uh, some of these guys down in Barracks 128 <laughs> were planting potatoes, and we're going to get some seeds. So <clears throat> they were, you know, everybody was asking for spades and hoes and. To make a long story short, we put them in. We got a, we got a, we got a, we got a pail too. Did they have a fire pool? What they called a fire pool up there at Bars? No. Oh. They had an area. They had an area probably. Uh, oh, I'm guessing 15 feet wide and 15 feet uh, long. Bricked, made out of bricks. Yeah. Dug in the ground. And that was a fire pool. In other words. And it was full of water all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, they did have that. That's right, yeah. So if they had a fire where they'd come yeah. in with a fire yeah. wagon and yeah. throw the hose in there and yeah. practice. Yeah. <coughs> well, um, 
What was I going to say? Oh, we've got it. We've got a pail. Put it in the fire pool, duck, took some water out, and made little ditches beside, <laughs> you know, irrigates. Sure. You irrigate this, this field. Well, we got a hold of some carrot seeds, and we got a hold of some tomatoes, tomato seeds. And here again, I'm going to skip because <laughs> we were sitting out on the on the east side of the barracks one day. And the navigator, he was from New York, he had never seen a cow. I don't know, they got a, we got a hold of some books and somebody was running through the books and here was a picture of a Holstein cow. You know, and, and he, he saw that and he said, what, what is that? Well, that's, that's, that's a cow. Well, what's a cow? Well, that's where the milk comes from. That's a Holstein cow. Well, he kind of smiled because he, he'd never seen a never seen a cow, never seen a Holstein cow. But anyway, we were sitting there on the east side of the barracks, nice summer, June, July day, and and these uh, tomatoes were probably up, well, maybe that far out of the ground, and right beside them were the potatoes, and the potatoes were doing real good. Boy, they they were up about like that. <coughs> So Belmire, the navigator, said to see. He turned to me and he said, uh, "He said, I, I, I can't, I can't see those potatoes. He says I can see those little tomatoes on, the, on the vine, but I can't see the potatoes." <laughs> well, I said, "Mel, they're right there. See those vine, those green? Yeah, but I said, I says I can't see any potatoes." <laughs> he didn't know, and I just suddenly realized that he was sincere. <laughs> yeah. He thought those potatoes were supposed to grow. On the vines, just like the tomatoes. <laughs> so we had a we had a we had a we kidded him about that for a long time. <clears throat> well, Fourth of July came along in the summer of '44, and I don't know where the fellows got green felt, and they put together some boards, and I don't know where they got somebody. I guess got a box full of sugar sugar cubes, you know, sugar lumps. And they, they took the sugar lumps and put the one, two, three, four, five, six on the sugar lumps, made dice out of them. Oh. <laughs> and by that time, we were getting quite a few cigarettes, you know, in, in the parcels. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and some of the guys, their folks had sent them boxes of sure. Roy Tan cigars. Oh, yeah. So they were really precious, you know. That was <laughs> high class. <laughs> you bet that was right uptown. <laughs> and <clears throat> this fellow, this he was, he was a Jew boy from from uh, Dallas, Texas. And he 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 got a hold of some green felt, made a table, took some, got these sugar lumps and, and marked them one, two, three, four, five, six, and you'd he'd he'd, he'd he'd play blackjack with a guy. We had some cards. And they could bet uh, sure. cigarettes, or these guys with cigars. Sure. You know that cigar that was worth about eight or ten cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, by the end of the day, he had you know he was a millionaire <laughs> <laughs> because he'd taken them all. Yeah. Say, do you have a newspaper there in camp, or do you get a radio, or find out what the world, what was going on in the world? Yeah, we got that um, Volkischer Bierbacher. I you probably did too. The news, German newspaper? No, didn't no. get that. Never saw that. Never saw that. No. Now, this is, this is a newspaper. There was <coughs> German propaganda, of course. Yeah. And Coming was, to camp? to get it in the camp? Yeah, they brought it in. Yeah. I don't know how many how many we got in the camp at a time, but it was, it was quite, a, quite a number because we used that newspaper. That is kind of precious, too. Well, I would think so. You know, we lined our beds with the, under the sheets or under the, <laughs> with the, that, those newspapers. But <clears throat> when you mentioned the, there was a there was a loudspeaker on the outside of the barracks, and I think it was about four o'clock in the, every afternoon, there'd be a German commentator uh, speak German, and we'd, we'd we'd gather around and if you could pick out a German word, of course, there were three fellows that were authorized to contact the Germans. We were not we were absolutely forbidden yeah. to contact. Yeah. These three men did all the negotiating, and they'd listen in on the on the news yeah. and, and take it down, and then they'd tell sure. us what yeah. what 
what the Germans, what the Nazis were saying. We were kind of careful. We, we Nazis rather than Germans, because yeah. the German people, were, we found out, were pretty nice people. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> and then we, they, you know, I'm sure like just exactly the, in the same as your camp, we had all kinds of skills. <laughs> you know, jewelers and carpenters and plumbers and everything, executives. So these engineers got their heads together. Oh, they told us to save, <coughs> save the uh, so the solder. Yeah, the lead. Yeah. That they were off the cans. Yeah. Where they sealed the can. So they they apparently had melted the solder off the cans, and had bribed the Germans the, to to bring them in a radio tube and an, an oscillator, I guess. So they made a crystal radio. Sure. And they could, con they could pick up the BBC. Well, that thing floated around from barracks to barracks, I'm sure, for just about a year. And the German, they did, they were always looking for oh, that radio, because apparently they knew or had some equipment that picked it up. They were picking it up too, I guess. Sure. And where was it? And they'd take the ceiling, you know, they'd take the whole ceiling out, where they'd tap the walls and maybe take take a space between the studs, take the whole wall out, looking for that cam for that uh, radio. They never did find it until just before we were evacuated from, from South Log Love 3. How many roll calls did you have? Did you have one a day or two, two a day? Two a day. Yeah. Form, you formed out formation out in front of the barracks. Yep. There. <clears throat> eight o'clock in, in the morning, everybody, w yeah. summer and winter, yeah. and four o'clock in the afternoon, summer and winter. Didn't make any difference whether yeah. it raining or snowing or... Did many men get sick in camp? <clears throat> Surprisingly, not too many. No. Anyone get to uh, lose, lose their mind? Yeah, or yeah. A few of those. Uh? Yeah, we had uh, one fellow on this, when I was talking, this fire pool, it froze over in the wintertime. Yeah. And they brought in a half a dozen pairs of skates. Oh, they did? You know, you could just barely put the skates on and turn around on this ice. <laughs> one fellow fell down and bumped his head on this brick on the side. I guess I guess he had a skull fracture. Went out. They said, you know, after two three weeks, well, sorry, <clears throat> Carson died. He, he got pneumonia and died. Another fellow just next combine or so down from us started screaming one night, just just deathly scream, and, <clears throat> and he had apparently he was hanging onto his stomach. Took him two days and nights before they came in and brought him out. He came back about three months, four months later. Scars like you wouldn't believe. He had a perforated ulcer. Oh. But he got him to a hospital, operated on him, and he came back into camp. Say, you should tell us about the great escape now. And, uh, that was, uh, I mean, unless you were going to say something no. else right now. Well, that's fine, that's fine. Just keep reminding me so I keep moving along. <clears throat> In, um, this is the camp now where the Great Escape took place. Saugatuck uh, three, three, yeah. Actually, Sagan, yeah. We were in this South Camp, and what was called the North Camp was where they had all the British men. Yeah. RAF, Air Force. They had us se segregated like that. Well, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> a couple of our Air Fo of our lieutenant colonels and and a, and a colonel who had come down early in the war, back in 19, I'm just guessing 1940, no, 19, yeah, 1940 and 41. Yeah. Americans, and they had put them in with the British. And, you know, as I say, these, these British, and these, these Australians and Indians, they're, they're tough and they're clever. Yeah. So they had devised all kinds of uh, ways to dig tunnels. And I was just telling you a little while ago about the tunnel we we took out the the, the drain in the in one of the big toilets, and we, we we chipped away all the cement around the drain so that one man could go down, get down in there beside the drain going out, and then we. That's in that uh, laboratory or toilet or whatever inside there. Yeah, inside okay. inside. It was a concrete floor in this in this yeah. particular one. A little, a little drain in the yeah. center of the floor. And I guess we dug, that was in center camp. 
and <clears throat> they dug that out, as I was telling you, just beyond the outside of the toilet, and maybe 10 feet beyond that. It was going outside of the wire. It, no, outside of the do wall. Oh, I said outside, outside of the, of the toilet okay. wall. Yeah. And then this big rainstorm came. And they, they had, <clears throat> well, I'm sure you had, we talked about honey wagons. Yep. A honey wagon was a was a was an old-fashioned, well, you used to use them in steam engines, right? Yeah, up in north, hauling water. North of the world, yeah, hauling water. Well, they, they would come in, and they would, there was, <clears throat> beside the, the toilets, in the newer ones, they, they had a concrete uh, sump, and they'd throw that hose down in that concrete sump, and pump out the waste, and they'd take it out and spread it on the, on the on the yeah. fields. They pump it out and put it into that there big tank. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The tank was propelled. I mean, they had horses to. Two pull horses. That. Yeah. Well, as I say, after this big rain, <laughs> and the man with the honey wagon came in and drove his horses up beside, and he was working away pumping out. Well, when he went to leave, he turned the horses out be around behind the toilet, and they, they went right. They went down right into this right into this uh, tunnel. <laughs> so that is the end of that. <laughs> you know. And these guys, they, these Germans stand up, oh boy, you Americans, you're really here. You know, you really think up some wild deals. Well, as I say, that week before Easter of 1944, <coughs> the North Camp, and they'd been building this without our knowledge. Uh, this was this was pretty pretty secretive. <clears throat> They'd been digging this tunnel, and they <clears throat> well we we they did things. Of course, we learned they they taught us in order to dig this one tunnel that I was just talking about to disperse the sand was a problem. Did yep. you did you have that? Yeah, we had the same. Because if you put it on top of the ground, yeah. they'd see that white yeah. sand right away. Yeah. So we take our socks. And as the guys brought up the sand, we'd fill our socks full of sand, put a piece of twine or rope around our neck and, and, and tie our socks. Then we'd walk around on the inside of the fence and we'd sprinkle that, sprinkle that sand all over. Yeah, yeah. That, that, did you do that? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing, huh? Except we had po they had pockets, see, big pockets inside their pants, and then they had a string on the bottom of the pocket. And they, they could pull the string and open it up and it went down the pants leg. <laughs> That they were all the same system. Yeah. Yeah. That was clever, but <laughs> we didn't get out of that one. <clears throat> well, uh, they had been digging this apparently for months. I mean, elaborate. Yeah, I know that was. No, you mean for the great. This is on the great escape. Now we're, yep. we're talking about right, right, right. The one that's been in the films and books yep. and so yep. on. Okay. Yeah, and that's the name of that film, The yep. Great Escape. Yeah, they. Um, they had dug this tunnel. Well, <clears throat> if you can imagine taking, oh, bedboards. We didn't talk about bedboards, did we? No, but I. Bedboards were about one by fours that they put. That's right, yeah. Huh? Yeah. That they put on under the, that is the base in each bunk. They were and, loose. Yeah, they were loose boards. And they put them in the bottom of the bunk, then they put the, this mattress. So called uh, mattress, yeah. Yeah, this gunny sack on top of that, yeah, and then your right. blankets. And they had they used those those boards as they were digging that they to shore up the the tunnel, right? You guys That's did, right. Yeah. You did that too. Yeah. Well, as I say, they they made an elaborate elaborate uh, it, elaborate tunnel, and we were even we were even assessed boards, you know, from <laughs> our camp, and that fence was about what 12, 14 feet high yeah. between the two camps. Yeah. So. They'd have a couple of guys t by the guards, you know, they'd get the guards, they'd be playing ball or yeah. pitching something and get the, and then then they'd throw a board or two over the top of the fence to the, to the Englishmen, to the RAFs, so they could keep building. But they built a, they built a, they built a, a trolley and a truck, even with, <clears throat> with wooden wheels and a platform, I mean, with, with four wooden wheels and a, and a place for the guys to lay down, and <coughs> and they pull this thing on a on a track made it, out of two by out of uh, bedboards inside the tunnel. Yeah. Inside the tunnel. Yeah. And, and as they worked forward. As they worked forward, and they'd they had a rope on it, and as they worked forward, they'd come back and yeah. 
Don't, did, you, did, you, did you get that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did, really? Except ours wasn't as elaborate. We never got out. No, oh, well, <laughs> they even tapped into the, the electricians, figured out how they could tap into the electricity, and they had lights down in there. They did. Well, this, the distance from the barracks to the fence, I'm just estimating, was like about 300 feet. And they dug that, they, they dug that thing. It, it, it was just about 30 feet deep yeah. down before they started out. And they, <clears throat> they had planned it so that they, they would come out. See, here was a fence. Here was, a, here was an open area where the guards and the dogs made their trips around. Yeah. Then there was, <clears throat> then there was a whole, then the trees started, because this was in the pine forest, right? Woods, yeah. But they miscalculated. When they decided to come up, and there were 52 men briefed, and I mean these fellas made, they made uniforms. Yeah. They made currency. brief currency, yeah. brief cases. Yeah. They made black caps and, and hats, you know, just, <laughs> I really t well, <laughs> here again, here's another story. They asked us to, they asked us to put on a, <clears throat> a play. Maybe it was the 4th of July, I can't remember what the occasion was, but it said, well, get red, white, and blue crepe paper. Ask the Germans for red, white, and blue crepe paper. Okay, so we worked up something and asked, we had to have some, we had to have some rolls and rolls of that red, white, and blue crepe paper. To, to put on this play. <clears throat> and surprisingly, they brought it in, and we used it. But we, didn't, get, but we didn't give them back. We no. didn't give them back. We rolled it up real carefully, put it in water, and boiled it till we got all the dye out of it. We had red, or red and white, or red and blue dye, uh, red and blue water, and we boiled that down until they were just red and blue crystals. We put we put those in, in 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 socks, and threw them over to the British. And they added water to the crystal red and blue crystals, and dyed the clothing. Uniform. Dif different kind uniform yeah. made uniforms. German uniforms. Yeah, <coughs> and they used that 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 is part of the the escape too. So. The, but, as I say, they miscalculated, instead of coming out, the tunnel coming out and coming up into the trees, they came up, they came out just, just at the edge of the, of the trees. And it happened that, this was, or this was about uh, three, three o'clock in the morning when they started going out one at a time, they'd run this trolley, one guy'd get on and run it out, then he'd stay there, and another he'd pull it back and let them go. Fifty-two men with with um, German camouflage, yeah. clothes, f some food. But the when they when they started coming out into the trees, here comes a German guard and a dog, and a dog heard the noise and set off and started barking. The, the soldier went over and here the guys were just coming out of the tunnel. So they, they caught them red-handed. They took, they took all of them as they came out of the tunnel, put them in a truck or trucks and said, okay, you guys are pretty smart, you know. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to take you out and, 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 and give you a feed because we really admire you for all your electricians and your carpenters and and all your engineers and so on. This was really a, a real, you know, first, uh, what do they call this? First state of art. Yeah. They took the fellows out on the trees. I don't know, I, I think it was seven or eight miles away. And uh, <clears throat> said, okay, you can, you, can go out, you can get out of the truck and relieve yourselves because you've been working hard and got them all out of the trucks, pulled out the, machine guns and executed all of them. Just shot them down. Cremated the bodies. And I think it was Easter Sunday morning. In comes <coughs> Mercedes trucks. They all had Mercedes trucks, Germans, with pulling this 
big long trailer with rubber tired, you know, homemade uh, car wheels and rubber tire trailer. And in that trailer was planks, and I'm just guessing, 16 or 18 feet long and probably uh, maybe 12 feet wide. They were big planks. 12 inches wide. Yeah. 12 inches wide. And they had dug up, they'd made a hole, dug a hole in this plank, and they had taken the ashes <coughs> from the from the cremation and put the ashes in these pewter urns and stuck those urns in, in each one of these holes and brought them in. And I, I think it was Easter Sunday, and they said, "Okay, you guys, if you're gonna if you're gonna keep digging tunnels, why well, here's here's where you're gonna wind up." Wind up. Well, <coughs> again, <laughs> the 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 way these guys figured out stuff that they <coughs> they had some uh, some uh, Polish stonemasons and some uh, I think it was British ironsmiths and they conceived the idea to let these Polish stonemasons build a, a monument and to put the, the planks and the, and the urns inside this monument and seal it up with stones and so, uh, you know, they, they appealed to the Germans, and the, you know, they were Germans are pretty ceremonial. They said, "Well, okay, yeah, well." So they let this, let these Polish men go out, pick out some rocks, and they were cutting them off just, just, just perfect, just like you'd see. You know, you've seen, yeah. you've seen foundations around Fairdale yeah. probably that are yeah. just smooth yeah. as can be, right? Cut, <clears throat> and then the the ironsmiths, they let them cut the. Got them a great big piece of iron. I don't know. I never did see it, but they said it was about. They said it was about uh, eight feet long and about uh, six feet high. A square piece of iron, and these ironsmiths carved the names of every one of the guys, and they stuck that into this, into this stone monument. And as I say, I, apparently that's still there out in the woods. But it was the most in the, in the Nuremberg trials. They said that that was the here's a physical evidence, concrete evidence of what the, the atrocities that were they were carried on by the Nazis. So they used it during the trials. As I say I understand it's still there out in the woods. Say how did you how were you uh, liberated from the camp there? <coughs> on the twenty no. Let's see. January, was it? No. January, February, March. No, it was in May. Uh, first of May, around the first of May, you got liberated, wasn't it? April 29th. April 29th, okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think. We <clears throat> okay. They came, into, they came into camp one night about 10 o'clock. The There's, Russians? No, no. Americans? Germans. Oh, Germans. Germans and said, we'll give you 30 minutes, we've got to evacuate this camp because the Russians are coming across the river. Well, you know, it was pandemonium, just absolute, yeah. <laughs> it was disaster. But everybody grabbed what they could, they'd, they'd take their pants legs and tie them together and stick the stick food or clothes into their sure. pants and tie them up and throw it over the back and away we went. Five below zero and about four inches of snow on the ground. This was, this was in, this was in uh, the oh, last week in March, yeah. or the first week in April. Loaded it. We walked, well, we walked 87 miles, I think. Then they run, run into the Americans in? Then they put us in boxcars. Oh, yeah. In, in the fourth, it was French 40 and 8 cars. I yeah. had to put 50 men in each yeah. one. You couldn't, you couldn't sit down. You couldn't, no, no. you couldn't stand up. You couldn't sit down. But how'd you get to Camp Lucky Strike then? Well, <coughs> Here again, we were in those boxcars. We got we went in those boxcars, I think, in Spremberg. And there were, oh, there was about uh, four inches of horse manure oh, yeah. in the bottom of these boxcars. If you ever been to Washington, D.C., or uh, yeah. you ought to go and yeah. see that museum. It is an exact... What's the name of the museum? Um, um, well, that's beside the point. Europe, uh, uh, European prisoners of war. I think it's oh, called. I see. Yeah. And then he went. To, then they got you to Lucky Strike, and then you went home from there. 
Yep, got on, got on a troop ship. Yeah. <coughs> they, they, well, the, the, when we were going in the play, in the train, we were going down from this. We got on the plane just outside of Sagan, three, four, five, yeah. no, no, 87 miles, to a town called Springburg, and we lost men. You know, the guys are just, they just pass out. Yeah. Tired, no food. No. Take, they take the shoes off. The first night was the worst. Yeah. The fellows, you know, none of us had very good shoes. They take the shoes off, and the, the feet would go just like that. <laughs> they couldn't get the shoes back on. No. And they'd, they'd had to walk, walk in the snow like yeah. that. And some of them, I said, just, yeah. they just gave up. Yeah. And I never know what happened, whatever yeah. happened to them. Well, we never saw them. That, that was a very, very interesting story you told us. And, uh, <laughs> okay. We got to find out a lot about the details of how you were shot down. And well, I hope I, didn't, hope I didn't bore you too much. No, no, no. I, <laughs> no all those details are very, very interesting, yeah. So I uh, want to thank you for That's coming here from uh, South really? Dakota. And I know that uh, your children or relatives will enjoy this uh, oh, immensely. tape. Immens thought. Immensely. Immensely. Yeah, I Amen. mean, it's, you know, first-hand accounts. And Earl, I want, uh, Elmer, I want, I want to really congratulate you and, and compliment you on, on thinking up this project. Yeah, this well, I... Terrific. Uh, no, it's terrific. No, if you guys are... This is terrific. Well, yeah. but you, you're, you've done the leadership. Yeah.